The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Welcome to LymphCast, the gathering place for physicians, healthcare experts, and special guests. We dive into the world of lymphedema, venous disease, and other related disorders, exploring their impact on your daily life. So settle in, unwind, and join us as we uncover everything you need to know about lymphedema and related conditions on our engaging show LymphCast. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 28 tonight. Glad you're with us. Let's go around the table and meet our panel, and we'll get right down to business tonight. From New York, uh, RVT, Jacqueline Sasek. Uh, greetings, Jacqueline. How are you? Hi, Paul. How are you tonight? I'm good. Doing, doing well. Are you impressed I got your correct state this time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Greetings, Dr. Glavitsky. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm fine, and I hope that all the team is doing fine, and our distinguished guest. Yep. So far, so good. Uh, the founder and creator of Vita Support MD. They make Vein Formula 1000, also Lymphatic Formula 1000. Also, the creator of this uh, LymphCast show. He's also a physician and surgeon from uh, New Jersey. Uh, Dr. John A. Chuback. Greetings, Dr. Chuback. How are you, sir? Greetings, Paul. Good to be with you again and uh, looking forward to a really great program tonight with a uh, special guest. All right. Very good. In fact, why don't you go ahead and take the honors, bring our guest in, and we'll get right down to it. Sure. Today's guest is uh, somebody that I've known for um, a number of years. I would say uh, certainly more than five years, uh, Mr. Nelson Bong. Nelson is a representative of uh, Lympha Press. He's been working with that company for nine years, but he has... Um, been in the field, uh, related field for 21 years, and maybe he can share some of that with us. But I know having worked with Nelson in clinical practice in our office, that he's one of the rare individuals who really has um, a true passion for what he does. Um, and I know that he sees his job um, as far more than a sales rep, if you will, or a company uh, representative. I, I think that he has proven to me over the years, he's got a great love for um, improving people's quality of lives uh, and making them better, uh, reducing edema in, in swollen limbs and all of the associated problems that go along with that. So it's a real pleasure to have um, him with us here today. And um, although I've known him for many years, I'm sure that in our discussion, I'll come to know him uh, even better. So, Nelson, uh, welcome to the show, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be on the show. Um, so, thank you. You're welcome. What we're going to do, I guess, is we'll get into some questions right off the bat, and I might as well uh, be the lead hitter since since we have worked together, and I, and I know you uh, quite well personally. Why don't you um, give us some of your background, Nelson, in terms of um, what you're doing now at Lympha Press and your experience in the field prior to that and how you came to be in this um, very um, growing and exciting field of clinical medicine. But I would assume that when you got started over 21 years ago, uh, it was uh, a very little known area of interest. So please share that story with us. Well, let's see. I, I've actually been in sales for over 30 years, and I've been in medical sales for 20. Um, but that, proves, one, that proves one thing, Nelson. What's you're, that? Old, you're old. You're old. Yes, that is for, for sure. That is for sure. But um, out of all the things, I, I've always wanted to get into medical sales. And once I got in, it was great. But then once I found medical solutions and Lymphopress, I really felt like I belonged somewhere because it was immediate results. Um, the patients were happy with the, with the actual pump itself. Um, the doctors were happy because we were getting really great results. I was happy because I was making improvements in people's lives and really growing the area that... Um, that we were looking to grow. 
Um, it was a very niche market, which I had no idea, but it's it's been growing and it's been great. And uh, it's it's really just rewarding to see the people improve. Um, so that's it. That's pretty much what I like to do is making sure that the, the, the patients are, are happy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing because as you know, um, as Paul mentioned, and we always mention, um, I founded uh, Vita Support MD, the nutraceutical company that produces dietary supplements that include micronized purified flavonoid f- fraction. And as you also know, Dr. Glavitsky was one of the key scientists who did some of the uh, seminal uh, research, clinical research on that group of, of flavonoids. And to your point, it is a really interesting and rewarding and wonderful area of medicine to be involved in because many of these patients who are suffering from a swollen limb or limbs um, frequently come across clinicians and physicians who really are not well-versed in the area and they're not knowledgeable. And they're told really there's nothing much that they can do, maybe elevate their leg or maybe wear a stocking. So we share a passion for, as you said, this this niche area of medicine, which really represents real people and many of them, millions of them, just in the United States. So when we say niche, it's by no means uh, some uh, super rare, exceedingly rare disorder. It's a niche only because um, there's still so much education to be done amongst uh, clinicians, physicians, nurses, et cetera, to recognize and treat these patients. So again, if you would share your impression of that problem, the fact that so many physicians still are not aware of the problem, not making the diagnosis, and then not referring people to the proper doctors, clinicians, and and, um, even companies like your own that that provide help and relief. If I'm getting you right, um, the as far as the physicians go, it, it's it's my job to educate too, also to to show them that there is something else, right? Um, besides doing like the diuretics and kind of going that route, um, and this will actually help the diuretics work better, if I'm not mistaken, um, because it it actively pumps that fluid to the core. Um, so that's the the angle that I guess that I've I've really talked about. And I've really been calling on all different types of physician um, to really educate them on there is another way that you can help the body just use its own natural resources to really get rid of this fluid and, and help out with uh, wound healing um, and just, you know, the overall swelling and too, and sometimes even pain from it too. So, Right. Well, one of the things that we've discussed quite a bit on the program when you mentioned diuretics and perhaps Dr. Glavitsky wants to yes. uh, jump jump in on that. One of the problems that we recognize is that in lymphedema, oftentimes there is a buildup of proteinaceous material in the soft tissue, um, and that proteinaceous material can actually be concentrated with diuretics, which can actually lead to greater fibrosis, sclerosis, scarring, inflammation, et cetera. So um, many times the patients who are on diuretics should not be on them at all. And compression, elevation, treatment of the underlying problem whenever possible. Um, And of course, pneumatic um, devices like those from Lymphopress are, are valuable. So Dr. Glavitsky, if you'd like to, you know, maybe say a few more words on that subject. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, uh, the huge issue in, uh, is with diuretic that it's absolutely not indicated in uh, venous and lymphatic edema. And this shows really the, uh, the lack of understanding of, the, uh, of these uh, disorders because uh, diuretic is just, losing water and uh, and actually in uh, those diseases there is no issue with the excess of water the uh, the issue is of the fluid that cannot circulate from the uh, the uh, peripheral um, issue up to the uh, the uh, the uh, general circulation so so there is absolute except the rare really very rare uh, situation with the uh, 
when the uh, where the origin of edema is mixed. The uh, the uh, this kind of treatment are well indicated in uh, cardiac insufficiency in cardiac edema in every uh, in in some other circumstances, not venous and lymphatic edema. So that that's uh, the point that we we were discussing very often this program because uh, it's uh, so um, widely spread misuse of uh, diuretics, which of course is not in its own in its own right benign. In other yeah. words, inappropriate administration of diuretics. Um, and this is great information for you, uh, Nelson, even to bring back to some of your physicians. Of course, we understand that you need to uh, conduct yourself in a very, you know, uh, uh, political way, for lack of a better word, but gently as a non-physician speaking to physicians and advising um, that um, this this can be harmful. In other words, if you have normal kidney function and there is no volume overload in the patient and you start using large, especially large doses of diuretics frequently, it can lead to renal insufficiency and kidney damage, et cetera. So, so it's not a completely uh, benign misstep that many physicians are, are taking. So I think that's really great information to bring out. Monica, maybe do you have, do you have any questions for uh, oh, I, you know, I have Plenty of questions. Right. Take it away. <laughs> and I, I would like to use the opportunity because actually, as you said, your um, uh, your d- device is kind of part of the niche treatment, and uh, indeed, most of the uh, of the patients and the, and the public are not very well uh, aware. First of all, when is that indicated? In, is that the treatment for every kind of edema, or the, how do you present it to the uh, to the uh, physician? You know, the, when should they prescribe uh, lymphopress? My other question is: uh, is that the, uh, the that is um, uh, uh, covered by the insurance? And if yes, in uh, which circumstances, and I would like to also ask you to uh, just describe how uh, this uh, pump uh, should be utilized in uh, practice. You know what? What are the really uh, base to air recommendation? You have the patient uh, with the prescription for the. Uh, Lympha press and what should you say to the patient? How to educate and how to um, how to give the uh, the best uh, use of uh, your device? Very good questions. Um, well, first off, um, let's see the insurances. Let's start off with that. Okay. The insurances will cover the device. Most of the insurances do cover the the device. We figure out all the authorization process for that. So um, what we need is we just need some notes and the prescription and patient demographics, and we'll figure all that stuff out. Um, as far as the, it's covered, as long as they are diagnosed with lymphedema. So, so if lymphedema there's a diagnosis, yeah. Yeah. if there's a diagnosis of lymphedema, then more than likely it will be covered. If it's just edema then it won't be covered because it's not lymphedema defined as that. Um, so it does have to be you know, diagnosed as lymphedema. Um, the insurances Nelson, do cover it. Yes. Nelson, for our physicians who may be listening, I'm sure you know it off the top of your head. Do you know what the diagnosis code would be for lymphedema if they're prescribing? Yes. Typically, it's I-89.0. Okay, very good. Okay, um, so... There's all these different indications. So if the patient ha- has venous insufficiency or chronic venous, venous insufficiency with or without um, wounds, um, then that actually leads to secondary lymphedema, which is a primary diagnosis of lymphedema also. And it can be from scarring or surgery or anything like that too. So Great. I want to stop. I'm going to stop you right there and just interject again for a moment because I think this is another point that we keep bringing out. But I think it's important for patients and physicians, again, Dr. Glavitsky, I know, is very uh, passionate about this teaching point in this subject, that, again, with the exception of mixed cases, which are rare with congestive heart failure, et cetera, renal insufficiency, and other things that could be causing edema, 
But in, in general, when you have a patient with venous insufficiency and edema, the edema is lymphedema. There should be no mistake about that. Dr. Glavitsky, would you agree? Yes, yes. It, it was a, a, a point of a, a huge discussion about it until uh, maybe five uh, to seven years ago, uh, because the, uh, uh, in fact, in the uh, uh, venous disease, um, when uh, the lymphatic system is working properly, you don't have edema. There is no reason. And uh, so whenever you have edema, you have the uh, issue with the uh, lymphatic system. So that means that uh, in the uh, in venous disease, even without wounds, you have phlebolymphedema. And this now is agreed, you know, under all uh, common, um, all, all these kind of issues are covered by the, uh, the uh, domination of chronic edema. And, uh, and uh, indeed, when you take the uh, lymphedema, now you have the uh, division into primary. So primary is all the congenital cases and so and so and so. And secondary, secondary can be after the surgery, uh, it can be uh, related to uh, uh, some other diseases and among them venous disease. And venous disease actually following the the, uh, the recent study represents probably like uh, 80% of secondary lymphedema not related to surgery and not related to filariasis, another uh, cause of uh, lymphedema. So, so that's, that's the, uh, the image that we have right now. And I think, Nelson, the next part of the question would be for you to address as Dr. Glavitsky's question was, and how... How do you basically advise or instruct patients to use this device? Uh, well, the nice thing with, with uh, lymphoprasis is we do instruct the patients. Every single patient gets visited by us. Um, so we do instruct the patients to try to really use it two to three times per day for an hour each time. Um, and typically the setting is set at 40 millimeters mercury pressure, <clears throat> and it is sequential to, for that. So, so uh, an hour a day? An, an hour, hour, per an hour two to three times a day. Wow. Right. It's a lot of time. It is a lot of time. The way I always structure that too, though, is, you know, I say try to, in the beginning, really try to use it three times a day for an hour. If you can't fit all of that in, then use it as much as you can. If you can do it an hour in the morning, an hour at night, and if you have a half an hour in between, then use it for a half an hour. Something is better than nothing. So... Mm-hmm. If you can go ahead and, and kind of, even if you just did a half hour, half hour, half hour, you know, really try to structure that into your day and fit it into your schedule. If you can only do it twice a day during the week and then on the weekends when you're off, you can do it three times a day, then it's going to help you even. So explain to to our audience, what does it mean sequential? Sequential means that there's, there's different um, chambers in the pump and the leg sleeve. So it'll start at the foot and ankle. And then hold there, it'll go all the way, it'll go to the calf, the knee, and then the thigh. And then um, then it will deflate, and then it will start also, it'll start again from the foot and ankle and go up. So what it's doing is it's gradually pushing that um, fluid to uh, into the, you know, up, up the legs and into your core. So you can go ahead and extract extract it out. Yeah, I think of it generally as sort of a, a, a milking kind of a mechanism, starting from from the distal part of the leg, the foot and ankle, and then, as you said, sequentially, uh, chamber by chamber, inflating and going going up the thigh. So there are f- four chambers in the device or five? Well, there's there's four chambers in the basic pump, and then there's 12 chambers in the optimal plus pump. So we do have an, a more advanced pump and also a basic pump. What we'll do is we'll get the best pump for the patient that their insurance will pay for. The 12 chamber pump does also have a wave formation, which is a little bit more comfortable for some patients. Um, so that will has 12 chambers. So it's a little bit more gradual as far as inflation. Um, but then there's also the wave format, which the first three chambers will inflate. Then as the first chamber deflates, the fourth chamber inflates and so on and so on, the second and the fifth and all that. So and the, you patient, always have... the patient should be wearing 
nothing underneath the pump or compression stocking or either? They can actually have compression stocking because underneath the pump, it's not going to double the pressure or anything like that. Um, they should have something on their skin just to make sure that it's not going to cause any sweating or anything like your breakdown of the skin. Uh, it also makes it easy to wear because it, the way our sleeves are, 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 are uh, manufactured, they're easy to slide on. So if you have something on your legs, it's going to slide a lot better than if it's on your bare skin. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. And what is the maximal pressure that you uh, exert on the skin? With well, the-, uh, the, the pumps can actually, uh, you can adjust the pumps anywhere from 20 all the way up to 80 millimeters of mercury pressure. So mm-hmm. typically we're, we're set at 40 millimeters of mercury pressure, um, but we can always, we'll always decrease it. If the patient wants more, then we always go back to the doctor um, to see, you know, what pressure they feel, feel good at. Um, but 40 is usually high enough to push a lot of the fluid, but it's also low enough to be comfortable the way I explain it to the patients. And I, the way I also explain it is, it's only 20% of what a blood pressure cuff goes to because those can come to sometimes be very painful for some patients. So Yeah, that, that was also my, my uh, question because it's truly whoever tried the 30 to 40 compression stocking, it's for me impossible. <laughs> I, I really, I don't get how the patient can tolerate such a pressure because it's it's terrible not only to... Put it on, but <laughs> yeah, to to uh, to to feel it. But this is also the way that the sequences work. It goes through the um, that is the cycle. It goes through the cycle about sixty or seventy times per hour. Okay, so it's not just going up to the forty millimeters mercury pressure and holding it. Okay, so it's not like that. It's not like a stocking. So it, it, it's going on and off. So that once it's all in way inflated to 40, then it deflates all the way under five millimeters mercury pressure, then starts back up. So it's actually, you know, giving them some relief and then and then milking that, that lymph, lymphatic fluid. With, the, back uh, up. with certainly direction of the, uh, uh, that push the, uh, the uh, uh, liquid, the fluid accumulate in the, uh, in the leg. Correct. From distal to, yep. Hey, uh, Paul, you know, we often we often find that you've got some good questions, but we we often leave you to to the end. I, I don't want you to feel that you need to be at the end. And I know that you often have some questions from the quote unquote layperson's perspective. So anything coming to mind uh, yet that you might uh, run by uh, Nelson? Just a couple of things so, so that I understand this correctly. Uh, Nelson, this, this is essentially... Uh, the lymphopress is essentially the, a compression type deal for the arms and legs. Do I have that right? Yes, it's a compression pump. Okay, and then uh, I also understand you sometimes get to work with patients. I don't, I don't know if you're a doctor or not. I got the impression you were not, but you get to demonstrate at least to show them how to use it. Is that correct? Yes. Once everything's approved and the patients get the pump, then either myself or one of our um, patient coordinators will actually go out and instruct the patients on how to use this so that they're comfortable. We take measurements before and after, um, which is which is a great feeling for the patients too, because I've seen anywhere from a, a one centimeter difference in circumference all the way up to sometimes four and five centimeter difference in circumference um, within a half an hour. So we run it for about a half an hour and we can actually see that their their legs have gotten smaller or their arms. Okay, now a question that would typically be asked of me, uh, people would tell me to ask this question if they had a chance to, can patients go directly to you or is it strictly has to be referred to by a physician? It is a prescription device. Yeah. So um, any, uh, a, I mean, I have anything from podiatrists to um, nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, MDs, DOs, they can all um, prescribe them from any field. I actually have a pulmonologist that actually writes for them too. So it's kind of a weird um, you know, transition, but that he says that that's really the first thing that patients complain about. So 
Okay, so they can't just show up at your store and say, I want two of those and three of those and wrap them up for me. <laughs> I wish I wish I had a store, but, you know, it's not that easy. Right. Well, not that all, easy. All, all joking aside, it's a great question because uh, my question is, this um, device, it, it is covered by insurance with the proper diagnosis code, et cetera, but could a patient purchase one for cash if, for example, they didn't have insurance and or they didn't have a prescription, can can a can a general public uh, member of the general public purchase one if they if they wanted to, or is that prohibited somehow? Actually, yes, they can, um, but they still do need a prescription from the doctor. So we don't need any of the the documentation and stuff like that, but we do need a prescription from the doctor for a lift for press pump, and they can purchase it for cash also. So it really is required to have a prescription. That's that's interesting. I, I really, I must admit, I wasn't aware of that uh, previously. Yeah, it should be. It definitely should be because, you know, you, there's a lot of things that can happen if you just purchase it off of eBay, you know, which, I mean, there's some stuff for sale there too, but, you know, then it puts the liability on who? You know, puts the liability on the person that's selling it or, you know, whoever's advising them to do that. So, so yeah. uh, any uh, uh, contraindication for the uh, lymph press? Uh, there's a couple of a couple of contraindications that, that I know of. There are there are a few more. Um, one would be congestive heart failure. Um, the other would be a, a recent blood clot um, or DVT. Uh, what we do at Lymphopress is we tell the doctors not to worry about that because what we do is we actually do a patient intake with every single patient we get a prescription for. So we ask them whether or not they've had, if they've been, if they've been um, diagnosed with congestive heart failure or if they've ever had a blood clot. And then we'll go back to their physician, their cardiologist or whoever's treating them for the blood clot to, um, to uh, get clearance for it. So we get a clearance from the doctor that are treating them for that. Do you pay also attention to the uh, peripheral uh, arterial disease? I'm sorry? Peripheral arterial disease. Do you pay attention and uh, and uh, verify with the physician about the uh, patient with, this, uh, uh, with these disorders? Absolutely. The, those are some of the questions. There's a long list of questions where we ask them. Those are the two major ones that I that I know. We have a full intake team that calls the patients and asks uh, a series of questions to go ahead and make sure that it's safe for them. You know, one of the things that I I do if I if I have a patient who has a pump and we're treating the patient, I will typically have them suspend treatment during the during, uh, excuse me, suspend use of their lymphopress pump during our our treatments because, as you know, with injection therapy, endovenous ablation, et cetera, you are creating thrombus in the superficial system. Of course, you have the potential to have a DVT as a as a complication. We we scan those patients to rule out DVT, but generally speaking, I have I have been very cautious in allowing patients <clears throat> patients to continue with the pump during my interventions for fear of creating an embolic event and um so i've never i've never regretted doing that but i wonder if that is your standard um uh recommendation as well from the company i i don't really have a standpoint i mean we were, would refer that right back to it may, it makes you know whatever you're comfortable with and and what your indications are and what you feel is right that's that's what we'll go by Always makes so. makes sense, but that's a very good point. This uh, the, uh, the 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 patient that several exactly, and you uh, you know especially with with ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, I think it's probably not as again theoretically speaking not as big an issue with endovenous thermal ablation where the vein is really being um, treated with intense heat and going into intense spasm. And you do get thrombosis of the vein, let's say a great saphenous vein in the thigh as an example, but studies have, have shown, histological studies over the years, that that, that clot is a, is a different kind of clot than um, a spontaneous uh, clot in the superficial system. It's much more organized, sticky, stuck to the, to the endothelium, which has been destroyed. So it's very unlikely that 
uh, anything is going to move that clot. But I do think that with more and more use of ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, um, including things like varathena and compounded foam, et cetera. I'm not as convinced that the early thrombus in those cases is nearly as organized or um, stuck in that vein. And and for that reason, I would be, and I am leery of uh, pneumatic sequential compression in those circumstances for fear of dislodging a thrombus, even from the superficial system into the deep system, which which of course can happen. People do embolize uh, great saphenous vein uh, thrombus when it's when it's spontaneous and acute. Uh, those those cases certainly have been reported with significant pulmonary embolism coming from the superficial system um, and then through the saphenofemoral junction to the lung. So I think it's an important thing to consider and think about for any of our physicians who are who are listening. And Dr. Chubak, what do you feel about chronic scarring in the deep system and in lymphocrest? Um I I don't think that that's an issue. It's a great question. I um I use lymphopress pumps frequently in patient patients with post thrombotic syndrome who may have um scarring in the deep system. Um certainly we wouldn't uh, consider it in acute fresh thrombus. But um, in long-standing thrombus, that's really um, quite well organized and very hyperechoic looking. And when you're getting synechia in the in the deep system, I think not only is it not not a problem, I think it's probably um, a very good indication if those patients have lymphedema secondary to post-thrombotic syndrome. Dr. Glavitsky, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, yes, you know, my, my thought was the uh, that in, truly in some lymphedema, you have the, uh, um, you may have the uh, uh, individual uh, anatomy of the lymphatic system that may be, you know, that not that uh, uh, the good indication to have lymphopress, but certainly these are as very special uh, cases and certainly shows you how important it is and how good it is that it is uh, only with the medical prescription because the physician has to really uh, wait the indication and see if this is a patient. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I suppose if there were some sort of um, obstructive component to the lymphatic system post-surgery or congenitally, a true aplasia, hypoplasia of the outflow, you could be you could be pumping against a blind outlet, and that could be quite yeah, traumatic. For example, uh, uh, the the very sensitive point is some patients are having the component with the genital lymphedema, and in this case, we have to be very very. It's a great. It's a great point, and I. This may sound. I guess we're in a we're in a safe place, and the point is to educate and learn and share. Is there any indication or such device for genital lymphedema, Nelson? There is. We actually do have a um, the lymphopants, which uh, helps with abdominal and uh, the the groin swelling, and even like hip swelling. That'll help out there too. So our typical uh, leg sleeves go up to about mid to upper thigh. And then we do have pants, which are kind of like firemen. They come up above the abdomen, and they'll they'll get the groin area, the the hip, and buttock area, and the, the genital. We also do have a pod, a pod which is almost like a sleeping bag. It's a little bit easier to get into if um, if patients have you know very low mobility. Um, I had one patient that was paralyzed on one side, and uh, they they would needed to actually move him into and out of. The, the pod instead of the pants. The pants have two single leg sleeves, which makes it a little bit more difficult, but the, the pod made it a lot easier. Yeah, that's very interesting. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that. I guess the next question that I would have, um, and anybody please jump in with any questions that you have. Um, how about referrals from uh, oncologic breast surgeons for upper extremity uh, postoperative lymphedema or oncologists in general? How how much um, are you seeing upper upper extremity lymphedema? Most of the indications that we see are for lower extremity, but we do see a lot of upper extremity too. Um, let's see, for the upper extremity, we do have we do have le- le- or, uh, arm sleeves, 
but we also do have the comfy arm, which covers the entire arm, the auxilla area, and it kind of goes through the chest area also. So it really does help out pumping right through that shoulder area here where a lot of lymphatic fluid will kind of stick if, um, if they're just using an arm, you know, night garment or something like that. And we do have, there is a chamber actually just right underneath the armpit, which, uh, which inflates too, which is very unique to, uh, to lymph lymphopress. Well, that's a very good point, and I'm happy to know it. Actually, I, I always have seen the example for the lower extremity, upper extremity. Yeah, and actually, um, do you know Dr. Karen Herbst? Yes. She's actually doing some some things also with uh, facial. Not that we're coming out with that, but it's it's actually, I probably um, shouldn't mention that. You can cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be my next question, actually, because it's an interesting subject. But uh, Paul, can, Paul can remove that for you in post-production. Okay. That's no problem. Uh, so, um, now, listen, I do have a question. Are there any potential adverse side effects to any of these? Adverse side effects? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. But, uh, um, like uh, dizziness or something? I'm sorry? Um, any uh, complaints from patients after the, the treatment? Yeah. You know, very few. I mean, if, I mean, you are, you are pumping fluid through your body. So there's a, you know, a couple of patients felt like they're claustrophobic, even though it's just covering their legs. Um, you know, just th things that people are, a lot of times it's anticipate. It, it's kind of anxiety about it. You know, yeah. once they try it on, they're like, okay, yeah, maybe I can deal with it. But then, like I said, I, Instead of using it for a full hour, let's start at 20 minutes. And maybe you can just increase it by five five minutes a week until you get, get to an hour. Or if you can only stand it for a half an hour, use it for a half an hour. You know, maybe use it four times for a half an hour instead. So I kind of adjust it to their, their lifestyle and what they can what can what they can tolerate too. And will most patients see um, results immediately? I I mean, that's the thing with with me, I've done done this for nine years, and I've always seen a positive result. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen an increase. I've never seen an increase, as a matter of fact, but I've always seen increase anywhere from a half a centimeter, like I said, I mean, up to four and five centimeter difference in circumference, which is pretty incredible. And that was only within a half an hour. Um, and we share that with the patient. Here, see, look, look at the results. And, you know, a lot of times they're they're very encouraged by that, too that they see that progress. So right. it really motivates them to use it. Well, and I'm sure that has to be a, such a positive uh, effect on the, on the in, uh, increasing the patient motivation actually, to, to follow the treatment, because if you really measure something and show for them, well. Yeah, and our, our pump is so easy to use also. Um, if you took a guess at what our compliance rate was for patients that have been using our pump for over two years, what would you guess? I was going to ask that question, actually. Me too. Uh, yeah. Well, I think... okay. I'll give you <laughs> a couple <laughs> guesses. No, no, no. We want to guess out of it because you already gave us a hint. You, you, you're hinting that your compliance rate for ongoing use is excellent. So... I'm going to go really big, and I'm going to say because I I know patients generally are not compliant with with just about anything. So I consider this big. If you beat this, this is really big. I'm going to say seventy percent. Okay. So any other guesses? Wait, let the let the other. Okay. Well, I, I think it I, uh, it has to. So you you know for the compression stockings so or compression therapy uh, generally. You have seventy five percent within the uh, uh, randomized trial when uh, when you have really uh, like everybody uh, uh, pushing the patient to apply it. So I suppose that you think that it's uh, very good should be uh, around this range. Oh. I'm going with eighty eight percent. Eighty eight. I'm wow. going with it. <laughs> Who keep more? <laughs> and how about Paul? Let's go with 88.5. Oh, he's got over the top. Why not? All right, Nelson, what's the real number? Well, it's it's so funny because when I first started nine years ago, they asked me that same question. And I was like, you know, if we could just get 50% to be compliant after two years, I mean, that would be phenomenal, right? 50%. They told me 87%. 87%. Oh, 
Wow. 87%. <laughs> so congratulations. Well, you did go over, but that's okay. Now, if but, we use the uh, shop. If we use the Price is Right rules where you went over, <laughs> Monica would actually win with 75. Right. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I was I was very impressed with 87%. Oh, I, it's, I, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. But I do believe it only because my patients love the device and they do get great results and they feel better. They look better and they feel better. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. You know, in, in general, in medicine, you know, uh, an adage that you can pretty much count on is that uh, pressure, pressure equals pain, um, pressure equals discomfort. If you have distension of anything, distended bowel, distended gallbladder, distended uh, lower extremity, upper extremity, there's going to be discomfort. And when you alleviate that distension, um, you're going to have relief. And also, also of course, for many people, um, men and women both, quite frankly, the disfigurement that comes with a swollen limb is is obviously very very troubling in a lot of ways uh you know psycho psycho emotionally and psychosocially and so on and so forth so to bring down that leg circumference um at all to any degree is comes comes as a as a great relief um so i could see why it would be so high oh, I, I, I had another question sorry Monica. how about how about urination do the patient should they expect to urinate more when using the device more than likely yes um i i actually had a patient that uh i went out to see him he was at 40 millimeters mercury pressure and i was like it's not doing anything and he had been using it for a couple of weeks at 40 three times a day just like just nothing and uh we, we called his doctor the doctor said oh you can go anywhere from 50 to 60. So go up to 50 to 60. So I put it up to 50 and we ran it for about 45 minutes. And he was like, get me out of this. And he went straight to the bathroom and he was like, I haven't urinated like that in like a month. So it just, it, you know, it, it pushed that fluid. And he was like, this is great. And we saw his circumference go down by like three cent three centimeters, almost <laughs> in each, uh, each place. So I think that's very important to understand. And that's important for patients and physicians to understand that these devices are not working simply in kind of a gimmicky way where you're just pushing fluid to the core um, and then you should expect, let's say, your belly to swell or your pelvis to swell or your uh, genitalia to swell. To swell. The, what's fascinating about the effectiveness of these devices um, is that it, it is pushing the fluid centrally, but that's, that fluid then finds its way into the general circulation, which finds its way to the kidney, which finds its way to the to the nephron, which produces which produces urine. So you are actually expelling, excreting, and um, getting rid of extra fluid as opposed to just pushing it around and redistributing it in the body, which I think is obviously the real the real goal. It's not going to be permanent. We know that, but even temporarily, the fact that they're going to urinate more, um, or in some cases they will, especially with larger amounts of, and I, I warn patients about that, that they might find that. And I've had that feedback from patients that they do. I think that's a very, very good thing, a very good clinical uh, indication that that this is really doing something significant. And my question is, uh, uh, you know, as a scientist, of course, I'm 
always very interested in the research, uh, which is uh, we, uh, like all the scientific proof of the uh, device or medication activity. And uh, uh, I have a question for you if you participate in uh, some clinical with the device. Yes, absolutely we do. Um, that would have to, to get in touch with uh, Eric Ansart, who uh, Dr. Chubak knows also. And he could, I mean, we do definitely have clinical trials, you know, going on now and also have had them. Uh, Eric has already been a guest on the show, a fabulous guest, in fact. So we all, we all know Eric quite well. Yeah. But we'll, so we'll I, refer, I refer that. that to that. Sure. Great. Important. Well, we're coming, coming near the end of our program. So uh, Paul, Jacqueline, any, any other questions or comments you'd like to ask or add? No, he took care of my questions. I just want to make sure it, uh, it you know, safely has to go through a physician as to what, like uh, Nelson said, we don't want people going on eBay to buy this stuff because if it's not in the hands of a physician, who knows? So it's always important to get the prescription first. I just wanted to confirm that. I thought that was the deal, but I'm glad he confirmed it for us. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing is with, with lymphopress, we're not just, we're not just here to, to get pumps to, you know, that's the thing is we, we want to make sure it's safe for them also. So that's why we do that patient intake with them. And we make sure that it's it's safe and it's okay with the, their doctors, you know, to go ahead and get them the device. All right, Jacqueline, any yes. last comment? No. Uh, can, I, uh, can I ask you, I don't know if it's appropriate, but what is the range of price uh, for, uh, for lymph press? Well, it, goes, it all goes through insurance, so I don't really deal with a lot of that. Um, the insurance pricing can vary, obviously, because of contract to contract. So, there and even with Medicare, it can vary all over the all over the place, just from state by state. So, I, I we really don't go through that. I mean, there is a retail pricing, but they can just call in for that. Um, but this, this is like within the hundreds or within the thousands of dollars. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're putting them on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> we'll I cut mean, this. We'll cut this to a ball. No, no worries. Just, uh, like 70 call percent. Me, call me personally. Yeah, exactly. I I'll sell it to you, but you know, call me personally. Yeah, we'll yeah. get that information. It's a good, it's a good question, but we'll cut, we'll, we'll edit that part out. Um, well, one other thing that I would mention before we wrap up, um, and Nelson is quite well aware of this, and Eric Ansard, who's been our guest, is quite well aware of this. I I really feel that this that this device um, and graduated compression stockings, for that matter, go hand in hand with micronized purified flavonoid fraction and um, the uh, handbook of venous and lymphatic disorders, which Dr. Glavitsky is uh, assistant editor on, um, in the guidelines for the American Venus Forum, suggest MPFF and graduated compression, that both are effective, but together even, even more effective. There's a synergistic effect. As you know, Nelson, I've been long uh, working with you um, and discussions with, with Mr. Ansard as well to try to spread the word because ultimately we want to provide the best care for patients. And what we know in this complex disorder of lymphedema, which takes many forms and has many causes and so forth, it is a multifactorial treatment process. There is no silver bullet. Underlying uh, pathology has to be treated. Graduated compression is indicated. Sequential compression is indicated. Elevation is indicated. Dietary modification, exercise, elevation, uh, weight loss when necessary. So many things. And um, again, I certainly think that uh, micronized purified flavonoid fraction is a, is a much uh, underutilized and underappreciated tool in that armamentarium. But lymphopress and vein formula 1000 or lymphatic formula 1000, for example, I think go together like peanut butter, peanut butter and jelly. It's like, I always think of it as, I tell my patients, like when you go to the dentist, you have, he gives you three basic tools to fight with a toothpaste with fluoride, a toothbrush and um, dental floss or dental picks now or water pick. So these are those tools that a dental patient has to maintain good health and try to support good oral health. And I think that this large group 
of tools that we have should all be accessed and recommended for patients to get the best possible outcomes. Well, that's certainly, you know, like the, we, we have to have a uh, comprehensive treatment for these patients and, uh, and uh, every element of the uh, treatment reinforce each other. Correct. Agreed. All right. Well, Paul, maybe we should wrap it up on today's show. We've had a very robust and I think educational discussion. Yeah, I agree. And we want to thank everybody for listening and watching LymphCast Show, episode 28. And uh, Dr. Chuback, before I go around the room and thank everybody, could you take the honors of thanking our special guest tonight? Nelson, thanks again for joining us, making the time. We see that you're 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 in your car. You've been working a, a long, hard day, and we we appreciate you really going out of your way to, to get us in your busy schedule. It's been a long time coming. I thank you for all the good work you do and assisting patients, going out to their homes, educating them, instructing them in the use of these devices. And I know uh, I speak for everybody when I say I, I know that the work you've done in this almost uh, decade of dedication to this area has really touched a lot of lives and brought a lot of relief to uh, many people who are suffering from uh, lymphedema. So thank you for attending and thank you for all the good work you do. Thank you, Dr. Chuba. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah, thank you, Nelson. We want to go around the room and thank everybody now, from uh, New York, RVT, Jacqueline Sasek. Thank you, Jacqueline, for everything. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Nelson. Before we go, uh, Jacqueline, tell our listeners again what RVT stands for, if you don't mind. Registered Vascular Technologist. All right. Very good. Thank you. From Ari from Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Thank you, Dr. Glavitsky, for everything. Thank you. This was my pleasure. Thank you, Nelson, for being our yes. host, our distinguished guest. And uh, thank you, team, for another super episode of LymphCast. All right. And uh, the creator and founder of Vita Support MD, they make Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. He also created this show, The LymphCast Show, and he is a physician and surgeon from New Jersey. Dr. John A. Chuback. Thank you, Dr. Chuback, for everything. Thank you, Paul, and thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon on the next episode. I'm sure we're going to have another very stimulating and educational discussion. That's right. We want to remind everybody, check us out on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher. We're all over the place. Spotify, uh, check us out. You've been watching LymphCast, episode 28. We'll see you next time for episode 29. Until then, have a great night. Oh, Paul, I want to add one more thing. They can visit lymphcastnetwork.com. Our website is up and running where there's a lot of great information about our guests, previous shows, our hosts, etc. All right. That's perfect. And maybe just give that one more time if you don't mind. Lymphcastnetwork.com. Perfect. And I want to thank my wife, Diane, and our executive producer for all the hard work she put into producing that website because it really looks terrific. Yep. No, it really does. Thank you again, everybody. We'll see you next time for LymphCast episode 29.